Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 26th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why, despite the influx of flexible federal dollars, which could be used to create adequate fiscal space, the House Finances Draft Committee substitute nevertheless threatens the end of the PFD. Second, we focus on a solid article examining where Alaska oil and Alaska oil employment goes from here. And third, we discuss an upcoming project which will explore campaign finance. And now, let's join Michael. It's Tuesday, and as I said earlier... That means it is the Tuesday Top 3 with our friend Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He comes in uh, every week to talk with us about three big items that he sees on our radar. Today, it's a biggie. Uh, and the uh, and the biggie uh, that we start off with is uh, the one that probably raises the hackles on my neck more than anything else, and that is the even with all the federal monies coming in, we could be witnessing the potential death of the PFD, and um, it is uh, it's 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 number one on our weekly top three. So I guess we start there. Good morning, Brad. How are you, Michael? I'm doing great today. How about you? I'm not too bad. It's uh, like you said, a busy morning. We're ready to rock and roll. So that's a pretty bold statement there, Keith Lee. Death of the PFD potentially. What? Um, what are we talking about here? So on Friday, uh, House Finance rolled out the draft committee substitute of the of this year's budget, um, and and it's it's eye opening in terms of of what their plan is for uh, the federal funds because they they rolled in the use of the federal funds, uh, the ARP funds in with in with their their budget so you can see how they're proposing to use it um, basically it is a uh, uh, keep on keeping on budget uh, it's a, about 4.5 billion dollars 4.6 billion dollars when you add in the placeholder they created for uh, capital spending uh, we have revenues of about uh, 2.5 billion dollars between traditional revenues and the in the portion of the POMV that's left after the, the PFD should come out. Um, and when you start uh, uh, looking at the numbers, that's a deficit of about uh, $2 billion that's showing up in the budget. Uh, what they do is they backfill, they use ARP funds for a, about $170 million of uh, revenue uh, into, the, into the general fund. Uh, and then uh, basically they take the rest of it out of the PFD. So after you roll in that 17 or 170 million, rather 170 million dollars of ARP funds, you end up with a deficit of about 1.87. There's about two billion dollars of statutory PFD. They subtract that deficit from the the two billion dollars, and you end up with a PFD of about 170 million dollars, the amount that they've backfilled in from uh, the ARP. When you calculate uh, the the per PFD that uh, that that comes out to be, that's a, a PFD uh, per PFD of two hundred and sixteen dollars. The statutory PFD is supposed to be thirty two hundred dollars, right? Uh, and, and the and the PFD they come out with, with come out with is about two hundred and fifteen two hundred and sixteen dollars. Um, it's 
as I say, that's the draft budget. Uh, and they will tell you uh, that uh, the PFD hasn't been decided yet. That's going to be in another bill. But you can tell what it's going to be by the amount of fiscal space they leave in uh, they leave in the current budget. They leave about $230 million for the capital budget, and they leave $170 million for the PFD of, of, of fiscal space. This is what there's you, a, there's a, I'm sorry, this is what you and I talked about last week, the danger of getting all this free money. It's essentially just another kick the can down the road uh, position. It, it is. There's a, there's a great article that James Brooks did uh, Friday evening in the ADN of it is Alaska House's draft plan for federal aid calls for millions to help nonprofits, local governments, and tourism. And as you as you piece down the as you piece down that article, it's got a breakdown of where the ARP money um, is going. Uh, and there's a paragraph that says this uh, to sort of back up the what you can do when you back into the numbers. Paragraph says 454 million in federal aid would replace tax dollars. In parts of the state's budget, that frees $230 million for the state's capital budget used to fund construction and renovation projects and $175 million for the permanent fund dividend. This approach is needed because the federal money comes with rules that might preclude its use for things like the dividend. So the way you do it is you backfill uh, other spending and create space for uh, the PFD. And as James says, they created about $175 million uh, in space. So you've got so we've got a billion dollars that the federal government has sent us uh, in in ARP money. Uh, as we as we've talked, that's available over two years. We've got about a three billion dollar deficit or more uh, over over that uh, over that two year period. It's available for two years. We've got about a billion dollars or, or about three billion dollars in deficits over over that period of time, um, and. And instead of using it entirely to backfill that deficit, what they're doing is diverting a bunch of it to other uses uh, and leaving, as James says, and as the numbers show, $75 million for this year's dividend. If we can't, if we can't create space for, for something that is substantially a substantially larger dividend than, than $200, if we can't create fiscal space for that, when we've got a billion dollars coming in from the from the federal government, uh, we're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to have the the, the the wherewithal to do it uh, once the federal funds go away and uh, and we're to to regular budgeting. It's, it's really right. I mean, it's just it's sort of, it's sort of shocking how how low uh, the dividend is with all that federal aid that's coming in. Right. Well, because this is a divergence problem, right? It's like you diverge from a, you diverge, uh, you know, one stream from a path and the further you get away from the divergent point, the farther and farther away it gets. And, and this is what we're dealing with now. The longer we go, the harder correction it's going to be required. And all we've done for the last seven years is essentially kick the can down the road, and we've you know we've we pulled further and further away from that divergent point, which was probably around 2012, something like that, and and we're I mean we're getting further and further away to the point to where there will just not be any more money left over. Period, and we'll have to have taxes on top of it. Well, yeah, and and <laughs> and 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 PFD cuts our taxes. I mean the the the, the I guess additional of. The impact on middle and lower income Alaska families uh, is uh, is huge. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I meant additional taxes on top of it. I mean, they will take all of the right. PFD, so it will be a full tax on the PFD, which means on a family of four, you'll already be paying twelve thousand dollars a year in taxes, and then in addition to that, they'll find some other taxation scheme, whether it's a you know, progressive or income or or flat or whatever it is that they do. And they'll say, well, we need this now, too, because we just because, again, they can't control their appetite for spending. I mean, this is just a continual problem in government. But here in Alaska, we just seem to we just cannot seem to get away from it and acknowledge that there is a problem. Michael, and it's, it's not only we can't control our appetite for spending in a regular year. We, we've got a billion dollars of federal funds coming in and and of that billion dollars. You know, 800. Well, they're only allocating the, the House Finance uh, budget only proposes to allocate 700 this year. So of that 700, 700 million. So of that 700 million, we're only allocating 170 million really to backfilling 
the, the, the normal budget. We're using the remainder of it, the remaining, the remaining 75% of that $700, $700 million for other things. I mean, to up the capital budget, to, to, to give grants to, uh, to, to the tourist industry, to do things that are outside the normal budget. So not, not only can we not constrain ourselves or restrain ourselves in the normal budgeting project, the process, when we get a bunch of money coming in from the outside, we can't, even, we can't even restrain ourselves from spending that on new things. We're treating it as a windfall to, 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 to right. do a bunch of new things uh, as opposed to saying, oh, good, it gives us a bridge to get to the other side. Well, I mean, I think that's it. Again, uh, we had an opportunity here, again, another missed opportunity. And the more people that support these kind of new programs and things outside of the standard budgeting, I mean, we should be focusing all about, it should be back to the basics. And instead, it's like, oh, hey, look, we got another pass, another free pass. Let's just keep going. Um, and again, I'm just so disappointed in, in you know, what the governor has proposed and what is being proposed by various legislators, including those who supposedly are the GOP legislators for smaller, more sustainable governments. Um, we're still seeing more of this. Well, we just, you know, this is what we've got to do to get us, you know, get us back on track. I mean, the, the economy will get back on track. If you put that money in the economy, guess what will happen? The economy will boom. But you've got to put it in the hands of private Alaskans. You've got to put it in the private economy because the government economy does not stimulate in the same way. Yeah, what we've got, what we got is government, uh, government picking winners and losers. We've got government saying, you know, this industry needs, needs support. That industry needs support. We need to give support to this sector of our economy, that sector of our economy, as opposed to putting money in the hands of individual Alaskans who can then make that decision on their own what needs support. We've got government, you know, standing in the way and, and diverting this money out to things that it's selecting. You know, the 60 down in Juneau, it's selecting uh, uh, need the money. And that's, you know, and, and we've seen where that's gotten us. We've seen the, you know, the taxes we've been paying in terms of PFD cuts since 2016. Uh, but it's just really disheartening to see, you know, we, 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 we're in a situation where the economy was down, revenues were down, in part because of COVID. The federal government responded and said, hey, we know that you're down because of COVID. Here's some additional some additional money to, to replace the revenues that you were down uh, because of because of COVID, we're not going to put restrictions on it. You can go in, you can use it as a as revenue replacement for whatever programs uh, you had, uh, and and you know and that would have given us a bridge. As you and I have talked about on the on the on the show before, that would have given us a bridge from where we were before COVID to where we're going to be after COVID, and we could sort of gradually, you know, bridge ourselves or or rotate ourselves. Uh, through that period with the additional using the additional billion dollars to backfill the deficit. But instead of that, instead of instead of using it as as the federal government intended, which is to backfill the revenue loss you've had, we're going to go out there and we're going to create a bunch of programs and a bunch and a bunch of grants and a bunch of you know re redirection of this money to things to things that those in government, you know those in the legislature think think are important that they've been lobbied to think, uh, think are important and just leave, you know, leave individual Alaskans uh, in the lurch by not following through uh, on the uh, on, on the PFD commitments, taxing that money away. Right. Essentially, essentially what we've got is we're taxing the PFD uh, uh, to continue to pay for uh, regular government programs and not using that billion dollars in the way the Congress intended to backfill revenues and to use that instead uh, to pay for our regular budget. What if anything? <laughs> what if anything can we do as Alaskans? We're down to the last two minutes of this segment. So, what if anything can we do? Well, I, to contact your representatives. I mean, I sent in comments uh, uh, to the House Finance Committee uh, uh, urging that we use this money instead to backfill uh, the normal budget, uh, create space, fiscal space for uh, PFDs. Uh, I have, you know, the comments we filed up on the up on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. Anybody can go there and read them. Uh, and I would urge, you know, uh, others to contact their representatives and say, no, we want to use this money uh, to create fiscal space for uh, for the PFD. We don't need to be creating these new programs. We don't need to be spending it uh, on uh, on other things. Um, and it's uh, 
and, and, you know, just, you know, the response of their constituents will have some effect. I hopefully have some effect. I, I would say that uh, amendments are due. Uh, House Finance Committee members uh, can file amendments uh, uh, to the budget. They're due uh, today, I think, at noon, perhaps, or maybe that got extended a little bit longer. And hopefully we're going to see some members uh, 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 submit uh, amendments to the budget that would create more fiscal space for the PFD. Uh, but it's going to take constituent constituent act, uh, uh, constituent contacts for them to uh, to feel the pressure to do that. Brad, I know I, I I say and jokingly say that you know you come in and give the verbal beat down each week and and everything else, but I uh, you know I, I'm 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 a little I'm I, I'll be say, be honest say I wouldn't a little dejected. I mean I thought here we went we made a lot of changes we were able to get a lot of the bad players out this last go around and we thought we had it. We thought we had it locked in, and then we've got the submarine by, you know, Merrick and Rasmussen and everything else, and and all these other things are going on. And at some point, people are just going to be like, uh, "F it!" I throw my hands up in the air and walk away. You know, <laughs> I mean, it just it feels like that in so many ways. Like it's not even two steps forward and one steps back. It's like two steps forward and three steps back. We're just we're losing we're losing the battle continually. And uh, it's a it's a frustrating thing. Yeah, it's, it's just that it's, it's that legislators go down there uh, and they have other priorities than uh, than Alaska families. I mean, you've got you've got uh, uh, Rasmussen who last week uh, went on the floor, made an amendment during the consideration of the of the expedited uh, 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 education bill. To extend it for another year, to lock in education spending for another year. Well, education is getting you know something like two hundred and no three hundred million dollars, three hundred plus million dollars of ARP funds. Um, so you could back off uh, general fund spending for education at least in part to account for the ARP funds that uh, that K through twelve is is getting. But but we haven't done that. You know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep spending. The same amount on 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 K through 12 from the general fund, and then they're going to have another 300 plus million dollars coming in from from the ARP funds uh, to spend as well. I it's I, I just don't I, I don't understand why uh, Alaska families, particularly middle and lower income Alaska families, who are taking the hit out of PFD cuts, I don't understand why they don't have at least the same, if not a greater priority. Than, than some of these other programs, but it's um, but but legislators get captured by those programs. They, you know, they get passionate about those programs. Uh, there, there there doesn't seem to be the same passion about you know protecting middle and lower income Alaska families. Let's talk about the effect of the monies uh, in the economies because I, I mean I think that's a key point. I mean you talk about and you you know you've said it you know ad nauseum that you know the largest impact on the Alaska economy on on families and on the Alaska economy is the taking of the PFD. And it seems like all these arguments, including the governor's argument about how he needs to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into the tourism industry uh, to get it back on its feet or to protect it or whatever, again, if Alaskans were given the, the, the dividends that they deserved and some of that money was you know, basically distributed to, uh, to Alaskans instead of held in the hands of government, I mean, let's just say half of it. Let's just say you know, one, $500 million was just doled out uh, to Alaskans directly. I think that that would have more of an impact than anything else. I mean, that money flowing in the private economy turns a multitude of times versus in the public economy, right? Well, it's certainly true, Michael, of of, of money spent on the money that comes through the economy in terms of the PFD versus money that comes into the economy through capital budget. The ICER analysis says that that the money that comes from the PFD has a lar- that comes through in the PFD has a much larger impact on both jobs and uh, uh, and income, state income, uh, than than money that's being spent in the capital in, in the capital budget. The capital budget tends to concentrate in certain sectors. That money, a lot of it leaks out because you you buy products for capital for the capital budget. You buy materials for the capital budget outside, bring them up. It's not being spent in Alaska, um, and 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 it's certainly true that the PFD has more. There is some. Uh, the, the PFD also has a greater impact on total state income uh, 
than any of the other uh, government programs. There are there are some sectors uh, where the impact on jobs may be greater through government spending, uh, but uh, but it's it's that's the regular budget. There's no data that shows well, that that money that's going out. Uh, to the tourism sector, for example, uh, in the way that the governor and now the House Finance Committee is proposing, is going to have as great an impact on the economy as putting money in the hands of, uh, of citizens well, through Well, we've even got politicians like this per- Senate, Senate per- president saying, well, the government needs to create these jobs. The government is creating jobs of these things. But again, all those jobs, especially in the capital budgets, those are all temporary jobs. I mean, real, you know, the long-term jobs, the wealth-driving jobs are driven by the private sector. And you've got you've created a whole industry that now has become dependent on government spending in the capital budgets and all this, and that's how they built their their business model because it's there. It needs to be more of a it needs to be more of a private center centric um, idea because that's where true wealth driven jobs are created, ones that are long term and long lasting, not project to project kind of jobs. Um, and again, not all construction you know outfits do that, but there are many that are basically built exclusively almost on government contracts. And that is part of the problem as well. We're on number two of our weekly top three. Unless Brad had any final closeout thoughts on number one, uh, we'll move on to number two, which is oil is you know pretty plentiful in Alaska, pretty easy to get overall. But the investment capital to export and extract that oil, not so much. Uh, Brad, uh, if you're all done with number one, can we move on to number two? Um, so there's a great article in um, in the Alaska Journal of Commerce um, this week that uh, talks about uh, where the oil industry is, and it starts by noting the significant drop in industry jobs jobs in the industry uh, since 2015, uh, and uh, and how those jobs uh, just have, haven't come back, while uh, uh, prices have, uh, have come back. Uh, oil prices have come back to some degree. Uh, the jobs haven't come back, and, and the article talks about uh, talks about that. Um, and and so uh, uh, Elwood Bremer, who's the reporter on this, called around to a bunch of people, six people, um, to talk about why that is, and whether they whether they see uh, recovery uh, in the industry. It's the best article I think that summarizes the current status that I've seen summarizes the current status of the industry uh, and and the road ahead. My comments uh, uh, that are in the article were, were basically this. In 20, 2015, a big part of the reason that we had the jobs we did is because we had a lot of projects going on. And we had Point Thompson, Exxon's Point Thompson project was going on that, that had a lot of jobs. Shell was still active at that point, just wrapping up, uh, but still active at that point with its offshore, offshore uh, uh, Outer Continental Shelf uh, Exploration Program. Uh, the Alaska LNG project was still was still geared up um, uh, and uh, and active at that point. Um, and you know, and BP was still uh, uh, running Prudhoe, uh, which you know BP uses more used more people to run Prudhoe than uh, than does uh, than does Hillcorp. Um, and so we had a lot of projects and a lot of activity going on in 2015 that we just don't have anymore. I mean, Shell wrapped up and left. Uh, there's no more uh, Alaska OCS uh, project. Point Thompson wrapped up uh, and is producing, but there's no more uh, uh, activity uh, in that regard. The AKLNG project is a shell, uh, uh, a shadow of, of what it was before. Um, and so there's really there's no project activity, and and even if even if prices have recovered, that doesn't that doesn't drive employment on its own. It's the projects that drive uh, employment. So the question is where we're, where are we going on these projects, uh, or where are we going in, in terms of projects? And there's two uh, there, there's there's prospects out there for projects. Certainly Phillips has the Willow project uh, that's going to ramp up and have some impact uh, on employment. Uh, Oil Search and Repsol have the PICA project uh, that they hope uh, that's going to ramp up and and have some uh, some uh, impact on employment. Uh, there's uh, 88 Energy has uh, has announced some new uh, uh, geological finds uh, uh, south of the traditional North Slope, uh, but north of the Brooks Range that they hope is going to uh, provide uh, some opportunities. So you've got you've got geologic prospects out there. That uh, that you know a lot of people in this article talk about 
giving us the potential to sort of ramp back up in jobs as these projects uh, go forward. M my comment was, uh, I'm, I'm not, the, the geologic prospects are good, but I just don't see the financing right now. I don't see, I don't, so, I don't see people coming in with the investment uh, necessary to develop these things. When we had majors like Exxon and BP and still Conoco with the Willow projects, but when we had majors, uh, they could self-finance, or they they had the financing vehicles to be able to to ramp these things up. But Oil Search uh, and 88 Energy uh, are not self-financing uh, entities. They need substantial backing uh, in order to uh, in order to ramp up uh, ramp up these projects. Oil Search has said that they're looking for a buyer of a portion of their of of their interest in the Pika project in order to. Um, help finance in order to help create an opportunity to finance it uh, forward. 88 Energy has talked about needing outside financing as well. And even Conoco has talked about selling a quarter of its interest in the Western North Slope in order to, you know, re reduce its risk, uh, mitigate its risk, but also to to help, uh, help finance uh, those projects. And when you look at what's going on globally, uh, there's a lot of other place, places to put your money uh, in the oil industry that have lower risk and lower a lower um, negative profile uh, than Alaska right now. So it's a it's a great article. I I, I really you know commend people to uh, to if you want to know what's going on with the oil industry, go read that article. It, the title is "Oil Industry Still Reeling from Pandemic Price Crash." It it was in last Wednesday's uh, the post last Wednesday. On the Alaska Journal of Commerce uh, we website, uh, you'll find uh, some really good perspectives on what the what the the, the, the potential is in terms of the geologic projects we found. But uh, but there's not there's not a whole lot of good good information or, or good um, uh, uh, updates on the financing side because that's just not that's just not out there. I mean there's there there are there aren't good updates on the financing side. Right. Um, and, and so we 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 just need to be more sober. Uh, uh, about where the where the industry is going, about and about where that employment's going. Um, a lot of people. Uh, uh, Machine Gatabi uh, gave a presentation last week before the legislature in which he talked about, you know, that, that a lot of people seem to be having, you know, thinking that oil prices are recovering, we're coming back. The, the industry is going to come back because prices are coming back. Um, that seems to be a, a general sense that some have. I don't think it, it, it's not going to be justified until we see financing backing up these developments. Just it, it's no longer the case of, hey, we found oil. Well, we'll, we'll get it developed. Right. It's we found oil. We have to be successful in getting financing to develop it. Right. And we've talked at length about that, how many of the major uh, financial institutions and financial uh, entities out there are very leery from a political standpoint of investing in Alaska oil development, and it's a you know it's a, it's a vanishingly small group that will work in those areas. So, not necessarily good news for us. Uh, we're about four minutes out, Brad. Uh, do you want to move on to number three, the dark money issue? Yep. So there's a um, um, uh, a new film that's out uh, that's making the rounds in uh, in public television. Uh, called uh, We Are Unrepresented, and it's a film that focuses on dark money and outside money um, uh, influencing politics um, and, and, you know, coming in and backing candidates. Uh, it's something that I've thought about for a while. Uh, we're going to, you know, help bring that film to Alaska. We're going to have a virtual showing up here. It's not, it's not set for a PBS showing up here, so we're going to have a virtual showing up here. Uh, it'll be available online, and I and, I'm, and and I'll talk about it more as we get into next month because uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this next month. But in the meantime, uh, Mike Shower uh, did a post uh, uh, a week ago uh, on his Facebook page that I thought was was a tremendous insight. Most times, people think that that the money and politics issue is really a left issue. That that it's the left who are, who's concerned about. You know, too much money coming into politics, and and that it really, you know, that 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 money really, you know, usually backs up the right. It's coming from the Koch brothers and others, and so uh, it's it's mostly people on the left side that are worried about it. That's not true. If you go to Mike Shower's uh, uh, Facebook post, uh, it's a 
on April 18th, uh, and it has a picture that says dark money. Shower goes into detail about why he's concerned about outside financing. And basically what this film uh, does and what, and what, what, what you understand uh, the more you read about it is as much dark money, if not more, is showing up on the left now as is showing up on the right. Uh, and the result of, of, of all this outside money, all this dark money coming in on both sides is it's, it, and, and the film does a great job explaining this, is it disconnects representatives from their voters and connects them instead to their, to their financial backers. Uh, and, and so our representatives, the reason we are unrepresented, the title of the film, is because voters are no longer represented as the financial backers who have, who, have, who have now created the ties with representatives on both the left and right. So I, it, it's, a, it's a big issue in terms of, I think, you know, what, in part of what's driving the partisan divide is a big issue in, in terms of what's driving Congress uh, to spend a lot. Frankly, I think it's a big issue at the state level, too, uh, in terms of the financial backers of, of uh, candidates on both sides in Alaska who are, who are driving the agenda as opposed to having a voter-driven agenda. I think it's part of the problem with the PFD, to be quite honest, that, uh, that those, who are, those who have a financial interest in, in avoiding an income tax are, are driving the debate and driving it more to using the PFD, taxing middle and lower-income Alaskas. B- big issue. Uh, money in politics uh, is a big issue. It's a big issue on both sides. Shower, I think, has recognized it correctly as being a, a big issue on the right uh, as well as the left. And it's an issue that, uh, as I say, we're going to be talking about more in the month ahead as we get ready to bring this film into Alaska. Yeah, and hopefully we can interview some of the folks involved in that and talk a little bit more about it. The, the, again, the, the, the irony of uh, prop, ballot prop three was, or ballot prop two was, you know, getting dark money out while at the same time being funded by dark money it really is the the deep irony of ads that are talking about the dangers of dark monies while in fact that entire ballot measure was funded almost exclusively by dark money coming from various entities and organizations across the uh, the east coast and and you know people saying essentially you know some of the funders and backers saying well alaska is a cheap date meaning they can go in there and spend their money and get whatever they want on the ballot and get it passed because they've got the dollars to pump it out to a state that only has seven hundred thousand people in it, and and that's yep. a that's a problem. Yeah, and I don't I don't it's not going to go away. I mean, we're going to see a huge influx of outside money come in uh, in the twenty twenty two election cycle, uh, probably even more as a result of of uh, of the open primary and ranked choice voting because you know what's going to if the parties are going to be are going to be uh, uh, reduced in power as a result of the open primary and ranked choice voting. What's going to replace it? And what's going to replace it is outside funding uh, uh, for candidates uh, to push them in the primary to get them into the top one of the top four positions, uh, and then to push them in the general election uh, uh, to, uh, to to get them elected. It's going to be money if it's if it's not if it's not the parties uh, sitting behind them. So it's. It, it's a it's a huge problem, and and the film does a great job. Justin Amash, uh, rep, former representative Justin Amash, is is featured in the film, uh, and he and and he talks about you know the the corrupting influence, what he calls the corrupting influence of money. He said, you know, I, to get a seat on a congress a certain seat on a congressional committee to get on congressional appropriations or or I mean House appropriations or House Ways and Means, you have to raise. He said, you have to raise a certain amount of money for the party right before they before they will give you that seat well you're raising it from 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 donors who 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 want you to get that seat because then they will expect things out of you once once you get on 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 that committee and and they will give you the money as opposed to somebody else the money because you make a bigger commitment to them so you're no longer committed to your to your constituents you're no longer cons- committed to the voters you've now committed i mean the, the 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 process itself is forcing you into committing to the financial donors and to back up those interests right um, uh, there's there's a piece that talks about how did our budget federal budget get away from us uh and and you know it's explained in terms of money that 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 you know uh, uh, uh corporations donors give to both sides with the expectation that those representatives will then represent their interests in Congress. And, and it's just, you know, my donor wants X amount uh, allocated to 
to this certain contract or to this certain defense program, a certain medical program. Uh, they gave me the money. That's what their expectation is. That's how I got on this committee. So, so bam, that's how, you know, we're going to, we're going to appropriate the money to them. It's, it's a, it's a, the film is eye opening in terms of the impact that money has on, uh, on the congressional process, and as I say, I think on the state process as well. Justin Amash and Mike Lee were in a previous video series on Facebook called The Swamp, and um, and Amash talked about that specifically, the how the, you know you had to go out, and, before you even got started, you had to start fundraising, you had to do all that, and it became more about the raising of funds and supporting whatever the party proletariat said you needed to do than it was about representing your people. I mean, he was obviously disgusted at that point, but it, uh, you know, it it it's really eye opening, and I I look forward to seeing more about this film. But, uh, you know, I I just question as to whether it's too little, too late at this point because we have such an ingrained, I mean, and that's really at the state level too. We have such an ingrained need to spend other people's money to do what we think is right, rather than look at the actual arithmetic or the or the finances of a situation and say, can we afford it? And uh, and I think that's a I think that's the biggest problem we're facing right now. And in the last few elections, Michael, we've seen more and more outside money come into state elections, come into the governor's election, come into come into the state legislative elections, and and, and it's coming in with expectations of 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 how uh, of how legislators are going to ask. I'm not saying all legislators are, are influenced by that, but but you start looking around at, at actions, for example, cutting the PFD to two hundred dollars. Uh, in order to avoid uh, uh, taxes, uh, and you begin to see the influence of of, of this money that, that's having uh, having on the legislature. Yeah, absolutely. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Final thoughts before I let you go. I, I'm 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 just really shocked and really horrified at what's going on with the PFD. If 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 listeners are equally as shocked and horrified, get out, talk to your representative, send them email. Uh, uh, call them if, if that's what you're comfortable doing. Uh, send emails to the House Finance Committee. Hopefully, we can push back to some degree uh, on this. Be, but uh, you know, we got a billion dollars in federal money coming in, and and we can only you know, <laughs> that's seventy five percent of us going out you know to to new things. We're we're using very little to protect the existing programs we have. That's just horrifying. Yeah, no, absolutely. When I started seeing some of this stuff come out. And I saw that article, my heart just sank at that point because, wow, it's just, it's crazy. Um, all right. Uh, again, you could send your uh, your email comments to house.finance at akleg.gov. Uh, that's your public budget comments. Thank you for, uh, uh, Pamela, for putting that up in the chat room. House.finance at akleg.gov. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him on Facebook as well as online at ak4sb.com. Brad, thanks so much. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board. It's good stuff. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.